Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Good day, good sirs and good madams. Welcome back to another episode of the 40 Audio Podcast. How are you doing today? This is episode 23, and it is the first one that I've done after a long, long time of not doing podcasts. I usually sort of bulk make them and then put them out and edit them and put them out over a long period of time. So this is the most recent up-to-date one. I recently had a thought that I should probably include a wider variety of people on the podcast. I usually stick to interviewing or other autistic people about their experiences. I wanted a little bit of a different angle on the autistic experience. So today I am joined by Michelle Brogers. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right today. Not too bad. <laughs> it's actually uh, Michelle Rogers, but I had to put my middle initial in my Instagram because of the <laughs> because there was another Michelle Rogers on there already. <laughs> okay, not Brogers. No, no. <laughs> but that I was thinking good. that I was thinking that that was quite a Americanized <laughs> uh, surname or something. <laughs> Definitely not. So yes, Michelle Rogers. Yes, Michelle B. Rogers. Michelle Rogers. Rogers. There you go. Okay. (laughs) Well, today we are here to talk about being a parent advocate. We're going to talk all about different ways of parenting an autistic child. And hopefully, I I think you've got a lot to um, give to this this little podcast. Um, So let's get right into it. Great. Would you like to give everybody a little bit of a background to who you are and what you do online. Sure. Uh, My name is Michelle Rogers, and I've founded uh, Champions for Our Children. It's an online coaching program. So basically, I have a couple of different options. We have uh, one-on-one coaching, which is what I've done for years. I've worked with parents uh, locally and now globally to uh, help them create a pathway for progress to, for their children. And uh, we are launching at the end of October, a uh, self-study course called Advocating Like a Boss. That'll be out, I believe, October 25th. And that is trying to just to get parents, um, if they can't work with me one-on-one, they can take this course and hit the ground running on their own. I kind of just put all of my secret sauce into it in the sense of what were the game changers, what were the needle movers to help me to uh, make the most um, momentum for my daughter. And I put it into that course. And then we are going to be coming out, I think after the new year, we're going to do a group coaching class, which would be an online um, experience with, um, with group coaching involved so that all parents can kind of get to know each other. And uh, we can kind of collectively work through our individual goals together. And that would be like the Champions for Our Children Masterclass. So that's kind of what my online presence is right now. That's brilliant. What initially sort of sparked my curiosity and, and thought about um, doing a podcast was that in my, in my journey, I, I focus quite primarily on autistic people and trying to help them advocate for themselves. Whereas with yourself, you, you work with the parents of those autistic children. So I thought it'd be good to kind of contrast them, you know, see what, <laughs> see what comes of it. Yeah, absolutely. So besides obviously being a, a life coach and, 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 you know, found, found, founding this program, I am also a mother of a child with special needs. My daughter was diagnosed on the spectrum in December of 2012. So um, I remember that time very vividly for me. It was kind of, um, you know, when she was born, there was always this, uh, 
these vivid ideas and dreams of what I thought her future would look like. And I was super excited and so grateful to be able to even be a mother. And I just had so many expectations for her. And then once uh, she got diagnosed, um, it all kind of went black for me. Um, Not even just the thoughts of, you know, what potential future she could have, but I just didn't even know what to do with myself. I was in a really uh, uh, emotionally dark space myself. And I just, you know, now that I'm on the other side of this, my daughter's seven now, I want to create it, create a program that I wish was available when I was going through uh, this to help parents get to good momentum quicker. So that's why I, I'm doing this. Well, I think it's, it's a very admirable thing to do. I think a lot of people within the autistic community, even myself to, to some degree, sort of have you know, like when when people talk about, oh no, like their the life is over because the the child has autism. Our sort of like initial feelings on that is like, why? Why would you say that with us? We're, we're autistic. We're we're us on on that kind of stuff. But for someone who doesn't come from an understanding of sort of autism and and don't really understand what that means for their child's life and what it means for them I guess it could be quite sort of a scary thing like with all the stigmas attached to it would you say that that's right absolutely and my experience or my exposure to it at that point was like nothing so from what I did know of it my sister happened to be a BCBA so you know however the cards fell the way they did she happens to be a BCBA that's a board certified behavior analyst their primary uh, focus is to work with children on the spectrum she, of course, mm-hmm. was the first one to, to see the signs, and I was in complete denial. And I was like, oh, you're, you're projecting uh, your uh, work onto my child. And then I remember thinking, you know, when I would talk to her about her work, even before I had kids, I said, you know, do any of these kids ever, like, have an independent life? And she worked with more severe cases, and she said most don't. So when this happened to us, yeah, my mind immediately went to the, to the you know, I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, and I can imagine. I can imagine like how difficult that that must sound. It's um, I think in a lot of cases that's mostly due to all the stigmas that are, are surrounding you know like autism and stuff. You know, you're gonna have those reactions if you know you start comparing what your child's future is gonna be like with what you would consider to be autistic. If that makes sense. Yeah, especially because, you know, you're told that the child, like all you know, if you've had no exposure to autism is that your child's not meeting milestones, they're probably not speaking. Usually that's one of the telltale uh, signs where you're bringing somebody in for an evaluation. Yeah. They're doing peculiar things. So yeah, your mind goes right to the, the most negative scenario you could possibly imagine because you don't know any better. You haven't been exposed to anything otherwise. So yeah. So when this kind of gets thrown into the mix, I mean, I, it could send you in a tailspin for sure. Yeah. And I think something that, you know, p- people may not know is that, you know, in the initial stages of me getting a diagnosis, my mom was, she, I think she describes it as being quite, you know, the same sort of being in a bit of denial, not really knowing whether the autism label would benefit me in any way. So she definitely went through those stages as well, but it wasn't. You know, it wasn't like a hateful thing, like so. You know, some people would think of it was just, you know, you, you don't feel like your child's going to have the the ability to to succeed in life as much as you would hope them to, or um, especially with like autism, uh, there is a lot of sort of social deficits that that happen, particularly like in childhood. So there's a lot of difficulties surrounding it even just with like comorbidities and anxiety and depression, like there's a whole mixed bag of things. And I guess, would you say that your work with, with other parents and stuff um, helps them to, to understand the situation a little bit better and sort of, I guess, correct their mindsets and um, view of autism to a more realistic one? Well, you know, no matter what it is, you don't want to hear that there's something not something not right with your child. And I'm not saying like, autism makes somebody not right, but it makes for a more challenging scenario because you learn, you learn differently, you communicate differently. So from that aspect, there is going to still be a process that you need to go through uh, 
I call it the, the it's grief. It's and this the five stages of grief is legitimately what you'll go through as a parent. And a lot of it may come from inexperience or, or minimal exposure to what the spectrum of autism could look like. But when I work with parents, it really depends on where they are in the in the mix of things. So I could be working with, um, mm. I spoke to a mother today who just got diagnosed, her son just got diagnosed in March. So she's still like in the, she doesn't really even know what to do kind of phase. She, right in the middle of like, probably she was in a little bit of a denial, I guess, when we started talking, then then probably near the the middle of it. There's There's the five stages of grief. There's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So I say she's right in the middle somewhere. She's probably between um, bargaining and depression, where she's just trying to figure out, like, you know, she she's now kind of, you know, still in disbelief that this has happened to them. She had two typical children that developed properly, that didn't have any delays. You know, she's still trying to work through that. So I guess depending on where I land when I meet them, we have to first figure out if uh, the grief process has been fully kind of pushed through already. So for me, I had to go through that from my personal experience. I had to go through all of that before I could potentially get on the horse, so to speak, and start to take action in a way that would benefit her future, however it may fall. So what I tell parents is I say, listen, you know, we work together. I'm going to help you to kind of get clear and get you on a path towards progress for your children. But I can't, I'm not guaranteeing a result. What I can say is that as a mother, as a father, you, when we were planning on have, having children, the job of parenting st- has not changed. The, the the plan of parenting this child has not changed. Just some of the aspects around this specific child have changed, but the actual parenting is still your responsibility. So you just need to kind of get yourself back into that state you were in before the diagnosis and say, listen, if, if the child was physically sick, you would get him medicine. If the child is not meeting milestones, we need to get them therapies. And we need to not look at this as something like a death sentence. So that's another thing we want to hit home. This is not cancer. This is something that and look at look at yourself. There's plenty of adults living quality lives with autism. My goal for them is because I'm usually um, coaching parents of, ch- of children, like, you know, probably 10 and under, is to mm-hmm. help them be the best parents they can be so that when they hit the pillow at night, they know that they did everything they could to give their child the best chance at a life, at a good life. And that's not just a, 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 a goal for a, 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 an autist, autism parent. It's a goal for every parent. It should be a goal for every parent. You hit the head, you hit, head hits the pillow at night. I did everything I could to give my kid the best shot at a good life. And that's kind of like where I'm really kind of putting their focus back. They have to get out of the grief. I help them to process through it if they haven't already. And then we kind of get back on the horse, so to speak on what we need to do to be a good parent for these children. I can, I can imagine that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot a lot of pitfalls as well Yeah, that some parents can get into, like trying to cure them or, you know, trying to find this, this miracle way of parenting that's just going to work for every single autistic child and it's going to be amazing and you're not even going to tell and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of like... Especially I've seen in sort of America, there's there's kind of um, a lot of companies that sort of set themselves up and they're, they're all very different from each other, but they um, they don't necessarily have kind of that wholesome encompassing of, you know, the, the basics of, you know, autism. Like they, they, some, some don't take into account that things like stimming or sensory things do not harm, well, in most cases, do not harm other people, so they're okay to do. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of that that different kind of stuff that a lot of things that contradict each other. Yeah, there's a lot of wonky things out there. It's almost like the wild wild west. I've seen. Um, I remember this was before I was even a parent. I wasn't even a, 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 I wasn't even married, and I went with my sister to a uh, conference for you know autism therapies and and I guess products people had to help children with autism. I mean, it was insane. I could tell it was total scam. They're trying to sell uh, nutrition. They're trying to sell uh, bariatric chambers and, and, and supplements. And I'm not saying that there, there are, couldn't be some validity to some things, but like to just come in there with this like cure all for autism. And I'm going to be a hundred percent honest here. When we first kind of entered the club, that's why I kind of call it, I call it like this club. And um, 
when I had a plan of getting out of the club. It was always my yeah. mission to get out of the club. I thought I could recover her from this. I'm being straight up. Yes. And as she's gotten older, I've come to the, my come to Jesus moment sort of came a couple of, uh, like, <laughs> uh, like, a, like a summer ago where I realized that even though we may have tackled the basics of uh, a child with autism, meaning she's now in a integrated second grade classroom with typical peers in a gen ed school, she's doing amazing. She really is. But as she grows older, it's not like this would dis- disappear. New- as she grows older, new challenges arrive that are age appropriate. So yes, I couldn't agree more. That was the, yeah, that was really the uh, come to Jesus moment, I call it, so to speak, for me, where I thought I was just going to, you know, I used to equate it to uh, prison. I'm like, I'm in prison right now. We're just doing our time. We're getting our GED and we're getting out of this club. We're going to do our time. We're getting out of here. And now I, I think I've come around full circle and I said, you know what, this is something she's going to live with for the rest of her life, but I'm going to give her all the tools possible to give her every advantage to have whatever she needs to be happy. And that's just been my focus um, since I came full circle with that, that we are going to continue to have challenges and we have to address them specific to her the way she thinks and the way that she feels. It's different than the way I think and feel. So um, it, it's actually it's like a new, a new language. It is. It's, it's, a, it's like a new language. And um, by, by being so hands on with her, it's teaching her that she can start to advocate for herself. And that's what I think is so important on why we should start this early, not just for the betterment of the child, for the child's outcome at that moment. But we also want to teach the child, mommy did this for me so that I could have this. I need to be able to speak up for myself to do this as an adult with autism because I need to advocate for my specific needs. So that's another thing that I think is just so, that's a reward that I hadn't uh, anticipated out of this is that now she's being given the tools to start to communicate for herself in in the way that is most comfortable for her. Which I think is is a really great thing, you know, make, making those adjustments so that you can accommodate your child rather than trying to push them into a certain mold to cure have, them. The, exactly, the ideals. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I, I sympathize with that feeling. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted this to go away too. <laughs> you no, know what I mean? Like, honestly, like when I was fourteen, I I thought the same thing. I was I was trying to get rid of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Which, I know. Um, I think a lot of autistic people feel it at some point in their life, particularly childhood when it's so difficult. But yeah, like I've been, I've been reading a lot recently and there was this, um, there's this book called Neurotribes and um, just, just the thing that you were saying about like the diet and, and stuff like that, there was, there was definitely like a large market of <laughs> yeah, it's almost like of, uh, it's cult-like and, too. It's absolutely, it's, it feels cult-like. Yeah. I mean, I, we were a part of a, a clinical trial for um, infusing children on the spectrum with uh, stem cells. It was um, done by Duke University. It's an Ivy League school here in the States. And I did it just, uh, you know, I had banked her cord blood. I always felt connected to doing that. But I never looked at it like it was going to be the silver bullet for us. There's just no such mm-hmm. thing. And it was interesting. I had created a group on uh, Facebook for it. And um, there were, just to find other parents that might be going down the weekend that we were, they only took 180 kids in that study. I have um, close to 43, maybe probably close to 5,000 members of that group looking for this holy grail experience. And, you know, I, I kind of regret it now that it grew so big the way it did. Not that I don't regret having the group. I just want to be 100% clear that there, this isn't, we're not looking for a cure here. You know what I mean? It's that if you mm-hmm. want to look for supports like a, like a certain type of diet or a treatment, I'm okay with that, but I, but I don't want everybody to put all their eggs in that basket because you're just setting yourself up for that failure again. And then you're right back into that grief stage. That's why grief, getting out of grief, making sure you've processed those emotions a hundred percent has to happen before you can start doing actions like that. Because you already, because mm-hmm. if you do that after the fact, then there is no expectation of this miracle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, at, at- the least it you know those kind of uh, miracle cure all kind of stuff is a massive money vacuum that you yeah. could be spending better yes and secondly 
you know, you're always got that ideal child in the back of your mind that you're trying to shoot for that yep. just doesn't exist. And exactly. you, sort, you sort of miss a large part of them growing up and bonding with them and, and as you said, being hands-on and sort of watching them grow because you, you're always sort of shooting for this ideal, I guess. Yes, exactly. You're always fighting. You're, you're not uh, present with this child that is just they're this little adorable person. This is your little person. You're just focusing on this person that they that you want them to be instead of being in the moment, enjoying the person that they are. And that's a part of this too. You know, you have to really kind of, I mean, yeah, of course, I'm always looking to help her to be stronger and give her whatever tools, but we also want to just stop and just enjoy our children, you know, for who they are. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's a lot to say for that. Yeah, there sure is. It's definitely a different way of bonding with your child. But once you get that, once you get on their wavelength, it's, it's, it can be really nice because, you know, a lot of people don't really understand autistic people. So if you can be that that person who understands how they work, understands the, what they find hard and what they find easy and try and work around that, then it's a beautiful thing. It, it really is. It's amazing. And, you know, we had, um, I'm just going to share this example. She had um, a dentist appointment and we, you know, we muddled through the cleaning. I mean, it was halfway disaster, muddled through the dental cleaning. And then the dentist tells me she's got two cavities. And I like, I was ready to cry because I'm like, how are we going to get through two fillings? <laughs> I barely made it through this cleaning. And um, I took Bribe it. Bribed them. That's what my mom did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I took it back them with a special interest. <laughs> I took I took it back to our home team because we have a home team for her. Even though she's doing amazing and fabulous, we still work on goals and stuff. And we created a plan to kind of prepare her for what was to happen. And it was really a beautiful thing. They they created a social story around it. They showed her videos of children getting cavities uh, filled. We ended I ended up going on Amazon and buying like the gas mask, just the mask, just so she can get used to it being over her nose. Oh, that's so cute. And yeah, we really, we did fit. We did it on the, we did it on her dolls at home. We sat in the waiting room even before we actually went there. We gave her um, a break card so she could just hold up this card when she needed a break and then the dentist would stop. We gave her sunglasses. I mean, I can't believe like the amazing things you can do <laughs> to really bring it together for her. And then when the day came, I mean, she did... I was ready to have a panic attack because I was terrified. I didn't know how it was going to go. But she did amazing because we had prepared her and given her the tools to process this experience. So, I mean, yeah, I just wanted to say that because, I mean, even though I was terrified, we went through this together. All of that time we spent to prepare for that, we sat down, we played with the dolls. I read her the story every night. These are moments of of connection with your children. Yeah. Well, just for... um... Just for an idea, because I know we were talking about this ideal for sort of your mindset for parenting. And what is, if you could sort of sum up the, the ideal parent in your mind, what would, what would that person be like? Um, what would that person be like? I guess that person would be, um, I want to see somebody who could process their emotions. That was probably the, the, the biggest struggle I had with it. Process your emotions around this. Really kind of understand that autism is a spectrum. One of the things I didn't investigate, which I wish I did now, and I would I would advocate this for parents 100%, is to watch content of adults with autism specifically to see what the pos- potential possibilities could be like. That might help a little bit. It still doesn't, it still hurts. It's still, you're going to expect it to hurt. It is going to hurt. But at least you can see that there there is a potential outside of like your worst thoughts around it. So mm-hmm. I guess the first thing I would say is for the ideal, I guess, parent mindset is number one is the education of self learning. You have to process your emotions around this. And then I want to see a. I am a solutions driven individual. I'm absolutely obsessed and po- I was obsessed and possessed with her speaking and I, not in a negative way, not to the point where I was going to torture her to get it. But I just remember vision. I was gonna. <laughs> it's good to hear. Yes, no, we don't want to torture our children. Uh, ne- I, I, I am absolutely. That's a, yes, that's a no on the forty thirty podcast. Yes, no torturing children. Yeah, we don't torture children. <laughs> I am uh, all about positive reinforcement. Everything we do now. I mean, it's literally like if I, I make an ask, she wants to know what she's going to get in return for it. But, uh, but like, um, 
I visualized her talking to me. It was one of the things that I thought was really helpful too. I imagined what it would be like to hear her say, I love you, or hear her have a conversation, or hear her watch her make friends. In my mind, I would kind of visualize that. So that's another thing. I kind of keep my mind in the space of what I want and what it would look like. And it just kind of like would, it would be like this rolling film in my head that I would just go over and over and over with, even during the, the challenging times to say, this is what I want. This is what I'm thinking. So this is, I guess that would be another part of it is just a, a parent that's driven and obsessed and possessed in the sense that they're visualizing the outcome that they'd love to see for their child. And then the other thing. That's realistic. Yes, that's realistic. Fair enough. But, or, or, you know, this is the thing, you know, there are still reels that go in my mind that she hasn't been able to do yet. I'm okay with whatever the outcome will be, but I can still visualize it. So I'm not Mm going to like push it on to her, but I'm going to still, I can still have my vision of what she might become. You know what, but you know, even with my son, even with my son and he's, he, he's not on the spectrum. He uh, does things I I, I never thought I'd have to deal with either. So, I mean, it's a, you know, parenting (laughs) is just period a a challenge, typical or atypical parenting is a challenge. So um, I don't know. And I guess the, the last thing I would think of for the ideal parent scenario is somebody who is not deterred, who uh, doesn't just give up when the going gets tough. Uh, acknowledges that this is going to be a challenge. This is going to be a different challenge than we were signing up for. And that to push through the, the, the setbacks, you know what I mean? Like, don't ever not like, don't ever put your hands up and white flag it. Cause if you white yeah. flag it, your kids, your kids done. give their child the happy, the chance at the happiest life possible. That's brilliant. What one thing that I like about your, your approach is it's, it's very similar to my mom's sort of, my my mom is the absolute she is the absolute gem she is supportive Aww. i trust her she trusts me we we speak about our emotions we we try and help each other out and she's always had the best in, intentions for me and she she does she does push she did push me to to grow you know in, in terms socially she'd take me to lots of social classes so that i've got the experience she'd explain to me the different aspects of autism you know there is a lot of utility in sort of being that that rock for for your child you know being that one person that really gets you and having that as a mom is just is awesome having that sort of holistic and focus around sort of positive reinforcement and you know having those sort of realistic expectations and those understandings i think is is a very useful thing Uh uh-huh agreed it, I can't imagine. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you didn't have a mom like that? Or if you had a mom that was focused on all of the wrong things or trying to change you and what that would I'd look like? Done. Yeah. I would be, I would be, a, a, you know, just considering that, like the amount of mental health that I have just from life experiences outside of, you know, outside of home, like at school and stuff. I, I wouldn't be able to, I don't think I'd be able to pull through if I didn't have, you know, such supportive parents. It definitely is a, a real important thing, um, especially due to you know all the social isolation and, and bullying and mental health that often coincides with an autism diagnosis. You've got to be the person that comforts them, and the person that understands them. Definitely, it's especially when they're little, because you're their only shot. Period. Yeah. You know. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors, Timo. If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com Dot com, or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thanks so much to my Patreon supporters, Patrick Vedi, Mol McCarty, and Julian Marks, of course. All of this support means so much to a little podcasting dreamer like myself. Anyway, let's get back into the show. So, um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was sort of, 
sort of phases, but I think we've touched on that a little bit. But do you have like... Are you talking about for like the stages of grief? Yeah, well, what could you, could you give us like an example of, you know, how parents change over the course of you sort of chatting to them and, and helping them out? Like, what did, where do they start and where do they go? Sure. So first we want to, when I, the first thing I talk to them about specifically is just to get some information on their children first. So I literally spend the first half of any conversation getting to know their children. When did they start to notice something was off? What, tri- what was the triggering event to that? Have they gotten a diagnosis? Believe it or not, there are a ton of undiagnosed children. That's been surprising me lately is how many children that are, from what I can tell from my experience, definitely on the spectrum, and they're not getting the diagnoses uh, that they need. Uh, cause you have to pay for it in America, don't you? Uh, no, between the ages of two and three, you can get early intervention. That's a federally funded program. So it's either early start, mm. it's usually called early start or early intervention. So that's what we had uh, gotten our diagnosis through. Then after okay. that, you could you would go through the school district uh, above the age of three. And it's not impossible to get it from a district, but it, it is a challenge because now it's going to cost them money to support it. So um, yeah. and then if you can't get a district t- to come on board with the proper diagnosis for that, you can you can go to your private, you can go to a developmental ch- uh, pediatrician here. You can go to a, uh, a certain child uh, neurologist, um, you can do psychiatrists, psychologists, they can all diagnose uh, children. But I think the reason why there are so many that are undiagnosed, there's probably two reasons. Number one is the parents aren't seeking it out because they don't know. And they're just thinking that the child's just got some delays. And then the other reason is uh, the parents are in straight denial. And that's the first part of grief. So depending on where a parent is at, when I talk to them and I'm asking specifically about the child, I want to know how far through the stages of grief are they. If they have a diagnosis, obviously they've probably passed denial because there's no really denying it's in your face. Sometimes you have that. You'll have a parent who even has a diagnosis and doesn't really believe it. when, When this happened to us or when my sister was starting to point to things that my daughter was or wasn't doing, I was in straight denial. I was like, oh, you know, they benefit if they say she's got it. And I was, you know, and then, and then came the anger with that. Like, you know, you opened Pandel. I'm really mad at my sister. And I, you know, I have guilt to that to this day. I apologized now, obviously, because she probably saved her life in the sense of got us on, on the train to progress. And uh, I said to her, you know, I was angry with her that she had um, kind of like, threw us in this boat and pushed us out to sea with no, not even knowing what to do. You know what I mean? Like in the sense of like, Mm -hmm. we can't undo what, what's been now said to us. So then after that, I was trying to, um, the next part of grief is the bargaining stage, which is really just the, you're bargaining with either with yourself, with the child, with the healthcare professionals, you're trying to get some type of commitments as to when this is going to go away. Um, you know, it's really a very complex area when we're dealing with it, you know, half the problem is the parents, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the mm-hmm. one, the one thing you're dealing with is the diagnosis. The other part that you're really dealing with is the parents. So then, um, then we get past that part and, and we realize this isn't going to be an easy, quick fix thing. There's not something that I can just give the kid a pill and it's going to go away. So then you go into your depression mode. Like what, the, what does this mean? And this is where we lose most parents. This is where white flagging comes in. That's why I call I call it white flag when they just they've thrown in the towel, they've given up on their kid. Yeah. And they just kind of let the system bring the kid through whatever education they feel is is right, not necessarily with your input. And whatever happens, mm-hmm. happens. And maybe you'll maybe we get a handful of kids that are lucky and they get into a system that really is supportive and looking out for the child's benefit and the kid does thrive, but most of the times that's not what happens. And then we got a lot of sort of autistic adults who really dislike yes. their experience of life and had bad, horrible, parents and- yep. horrible experiences with ABA. How could you let them do this to me? How could you let me go through this? You know, I mean, it, it, I can't even imagine it, it would be a, that would be a real nightmare scenario for me. And then the final stage, if processed correctly. So usually we lose everybody by depression is acceptance. And this is such an important piece because it's like, okay. This is where we are, but this doesn't mean that this is the end all be all. So I I accept that this is my, this has been thrown in our lap. I'm not happy about it, but um, 
I'm, what can I do to bring happiness, the most happiness I can to my child? So this is kind of where we go. So the first half of my conversation with a a parent I'm just starting to speak to is to get an idea of where their kid's at and kind of get a feel of where they at, where they're at. Because if I can't, I have to make you mentally, emotionally, physically fit for this. Otherwise, you're, you know, we can't really proceed with any type of plan to help the child. Yeah. And they've got, they've got to be open to, yes. you know, different mindsets and, and different ways of thinking about yes. the diagnosis. I won't work. I won't waste time. There's too many children that need support. I won't waste time with a parent that's closed minded that, that can't get out of their own way. If I see that, I kind of just say, okay, listen, I don't think we're going to be a good fit to, and, and there are plenty of, unfortunately, there's plenty of parents that need help that want help around this. And one of, one of the actual, um, the, the crazy things about autistic children getting diagnosed is because autism is is quite heavily genetic a lot of a lot of parents that i that i've spoken to when they go to a d- diagnosis they um they either get diagnosed themselves or like partner that's not not around or, or something for that kid in hindsight displayed a lot of sort of autistic traits and <laughs> yeah i think one of one of the issues may be in in a lot of those cases is if the parent isn't diagnosed and they are autistic, then they're not going to see any problem with their kid because they'll just see them as as acting as they should do. You know, these delays are not bad. This this happened to me, that kind of thing. Does that ever happen? So when I, I guess in a scenario like that, I would assume, and you tell me if I'm wrong, to assume this, are the child's maybe more of a mild form of autism? Yeah, well... Yeah, they they um they display more characteristics of uh, Asperger's kind of. Got it. Yes. So when I'm usually working with parents, it's usually right around the diagnosed age of two up until maybe ten. And uh, by if we're communicating, there's usually some major disruption to lo- quality of life for the whole family because of the child. Now it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean a, a nonverbal child is going to have a really you know difficult time with autism. My daughter was nonverbal and she was tantruming. I spoke to a woman this morning, her son is biting. That doesn't mean that that the outcome is going to be shitty at the end of the day. What that means is that it needs to be addressed immediately before it becomes a problem that we can't help or support as they get older. So I, I guess that is possible. When a parent's coming to speak to me, they're probably in that desperate state that they know something needs to change for the sake of their child. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. I could see that. My husband had said when she first diagnosed, oh, I gave this to her. And I'm like, yeah, let's not even go there. I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what this is. He's like, I gave it to her. And I'm like, well, let's just figure this out first. I think I think there are tendencies in her. I could see in myself. There's tendencies in her. I could see in my husband. I think we all, nobody, there's no perfection in pre- people. Even my son had, can have anxiety or he can feel, a, a, you know, he could have a hard time uh, expressing emotions and, and, and dealing with certain scenarios. Yeah. Everyone I think has a touch of something, you know what I mean? But like um, when I'm talking to parents, I, I usually, they're in a pretty uh, frantic state because uh, we have some problem behavior we need to hopefully work through. And I, I completely understand that. Like being yeah. a, a special needs teaching assistant, I, I do have to work with some, some sometimes quite challenging children. Like it's, it's, it's less about them being autistic and more the, um, the, the, the sort of behavioral issues that, you know, that may come with that from, from them not understanding around those ages can be sometimes quite difficult for some kids. Cause obviously they, they may think the world works in a certain way, but then not really appreciate that it may not. And other people might be different until they sort of reach kind of teenagehood and they start to you know, realize that maybe people are kind of a bit different to them. <laughs> yeah. So I know we've, we've talked a lot about the wrong kind of mindset to have, and you've, you've sort of talked about some of, some of the barriers as well, to be honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you think there's, there's, any, there's any points in your calls or, or anything that you can, you can see that there's sort of pop up that sort of lead parents down the wrong track? in terms of sort of helping helping their kid and learning to parent better? If I feel like, you know, this is the unfortunate, you know, I wish I could help every, every child, every family I come in contact with. 
but they're not my children at the end of the day. They're theirs. Yes. And if I feel like I can't make a breakthrough here, it, it's it's really a waste of both our times. And I'm going to say prayers for your child. You know what I mean? I'm just going to hope that maybe you'll come back around in your way of thinking if I feel like they're saying things or that don't align with what I feel would be best supportive around their children. I do a pre-qualification call before I do any one-on-one -on -one coaching specifically. And we're going to do this for the group coaching um, program after the new year that that'll be out um, as well, just to make sure that we're speaking to parents that are not in a, a, in some type of state that I feel would be detrimental to their children. If that makes any sense. Yes, I mean, I understand yeah, if they're sense. still going through grieving and depression and anger, I can deal with that. But if we're going to be like almost to the point where we're going to be hurting our children mentally or emotionally, I'm not, I'm not on board for that. So that we are going to be pre-qualifying anybody we speak with, because I, I just, I wish I could help every child, but you know, not every child is my child, you know? Yeah, I completely understand that. You know, that's, that's one of sometimes one of the difficulties of teaching as well. You yeah, can, you can see what, what, could possibly help them and and some of some of the harm that that parents may be sort of in, yeah. inflicting on them un, unknowingly it's help you feel so helpless and listen i'm not perfect i know i've made mistakes with my daughter too but i try and i write those wrongs as soon as i i realize i've, I've made them you know what i mean and i think that like you know i wish more parents really just went back to the basics of think about when they were when you were expecting this child, parenting was still on the, the list of what you were going to do when they were born. That does not change with us. And we need, and parenting was always a, a loving, supporting, teaching, education. None of that's changed. So just because the child is different than what you had maybe anticipated, the job is still the same. So let's talk a little bit about parenting and teaching styles. So in the autistic community, most people are very adverse to certain types of therapy. I think we've already mentioned it. I don't want to like highlight it too much because I know that it's like a, I don't want to be done for like slander or anything, but we, we yeah. all know what we're talking about. There's certain types of therapy and, or, and sort of organizations that preach, you know, if done wrong can be very brutal in nature. Got it. And very sort of harmful to the kids which is something that we hear a lot from autistic adults who've gone through those processes. What is, what is your opinion on those very specific um, forms of teaching? And what sort of approach to parenting seems to be the most productive? So, um, you know, I know that I've spoken to adults as well that may have been exposed to very um, not supportive therapies that clinically would prove to be successful with children on the spectrum, but we're not very kind in application. So I guess as a parent, the first thing we need to understand is that most parents are not educated in the field of communicating with a child on the spectrum. So yeah. the first thing is education. I, I did as much reading and watching videos and listening uh, to audio as much po as possible on the topic of autism specifically, just to understand what it meant and what it looked like. Then the other thing is, is that I was very lucky in the sense because my sister was a BCBA. So she was already working in this field. Yeah. While being exposed to this, not even knowing it was going to be a part of my life personally, I actually had watched a, a video with her on bad ABA and good ABA. And the doc, this was by, uh, Dr. Carbone. And uh, he showed a, what he called a rehabbed teacher. He showed the first audio video of her and this kid was just running from her screaming, didn't want to even do anything with her. And it was just, it was just a very hard, she just kept pushing the demands on him. It was just horrible to watch. Even I, and I wasn't even a mother at that time. I'm thinking like, oh my God, this poor kid, you know, he just doesn't want to, this lady's just like crazy. You know what I mean? Like she's just being so relentless with him. And then he, I guess, put her through some type of training about ABA and how it doesn't have to, you can use positive reinforcement to gain compliance, you can pair with the child, you can teach them in a way that's surrounded by love instead of by like this scary, you know, demanding person looking for these, mm. you know, specific outcomes for Sometimes these kids, you know, it does kind of sound from from an outsider's perspective, Educa kind of obviously, like, like I always or... tell my parents <laughs> that I work with that you have to go with your gut, you have to really not just leave it to the professionals to work with your kids. 
you have to educate yourself on what is the best form of therapies out there. What are the needle movers that that do the the most for children? And and I know that there is this is such a a touchy topic with ABA, but in the ABA that my daughter was exposed to was nothing but love. It really was. It was play and love and excited when the teachers came. And it was what book are they bringing? What toys? What candies am I going to try today? You know what I mean? It was always mm-hmm. around um, a good positive reinforcement environment. And that's the only therapy that we've ever been exposed to. And even to this day is still what we use. So because ABA is so widely confirmed to be a very good form of um, making the needle move in a progressive way uh, for children on this on the spectrum, it's still kind of the wild, wild west with that too, where not everybody is doing it in the most supportive way. So yeah. as a parent, you need to at least have a basic understanding of what is possible in the education that your child's exposed to. Yeah. And I think that there has to be a lot of emphasis on being malleable and willing to sort of t- t- try things and, and find out what works well and sort of take in different parts of, you know, of a sort of teaching methods or parenting methods and, and trying them out and see what produces the best results. Exactly. Never get hung up on one therapy or one idea either. Always be open to other options. Yeah. And that's all we've ever been exposed to. So when I've spoken to people, when you and I first talked and you said, you know, there's a lot of people that really hate ABA. And I'm like, I've heard that too. And I just, got, I feel so horrible. It's really not the experience that we've had. We have really like it. I mean, yeah, they put demands on her, but not in a way that's like, you know, she hates these teachers. It's, it's not like that at all. She really is a part of, she's a part of the solutions too. You know, we're almost, she's getting old enough to the point where we're going to ask her what she wants to work on, you know? Yeah. It's always been a, a, a loving, supportive relationship with her teachers. And mm-hmm. if it's not that, then there's a problem. If something doesn't feel right, you know, sometimes we'll come across a, a teacher and that maybe I don't like the way that feels. And I'll feel it right as a mother. I feel it right in my gut. I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel right. And I go right in there. I'm like, I don't like the way this is going. <laughs> and then we go in, we reshuffle the deck. We find a different way to approach it, you know? Mm-hmm. And um just going back to the topic of uh, my mom again, who obviously I absolutely adore. She's um, she's brilliant. She's also a, a quite an accomplished special needs teacher. Like she, every school that she's been to, she's also called Michelle. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> weird coincidence. I just I just looked at your name. And I was or like, not? Oh, or not? No. <laughs> Hello, mother. <laughs> 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 she she always um she has a, she has a word for the the way that she parents and she teaches she calls it holistic which is a very broad term yes. that can be used in all sorts of fashions and can sound a little bit pseudoscience and all that kind of stuff but it's it's basically just compiling what works best together yes you know? something that something that can help the kids and make sure that they have a nice time at school and then they're not traumatized by things they're they're getting all the needs met that maybe kids who are autistic don't need you know sort of like around the sensory things and making sure that they take that into account so they can help with their concentration and their experience at school there's a lot of aspects to sort of finding those middle grounds that work and yes that's yes. i think that's the the, the thing that we, we've got to drive home They actually call it um, natural environment teaching in ABA. So that's a good thing for a parent um, who's interested in looking at it. Um, It's called natural environment teaching. And it's basically a method of ABA therapy that's done in a natural environment in a real life setting. And it's not like it doesn't feel clinical. It doesn't feel forced. That's why I think it's been so successful for us because it's always, the majority of her ABA has always been in our home mm-hmm. or out in the community. If we go to the park together and we're trying to initiate play skills or whatever, you know what I mean? It's always been felt very natural with this extra person. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the, the problems come in when, when we sort of analyze things as on paper, you know, when we don't really look at how how the the, the words and <laughs> the information isn't interpreted and, and how each specific teacher can be using those sort of different styles 
I think you know, just just st- starting up in the the autistic community, you know, I, I was I sort of jumped onto that that bandwagon of oh, this is horrible. We should completely avoid this way. This is horrible. Let's let's push this to the side. No, I'm not talking to anybody who has any sort of opinion on that. That very sort of immediately judging kind of mindset. Yeah. To those to those types of things, but then as of you know, gone into different schools and seen the sort of the environments and those things in practice, I can see where it works and w- with who it works and with who it do- it doesn't. You know, I, I'm I'm doing s- similar sort of practices, but it's never cruel. I think that's the main no. thing. It's always done with love, love first. That's yeah. how I really feel about it. Like a, like a relationship, a friendship. So um, what? advice can you give to parents worrying about getting their children diagnosed actually getting them diagnosed before all of the the sort sort of uh, stages of, of of grief as you say um so i guess for if you if you're not sure if you feel like something's wrong to you know and this is hard because i kind of like was in denial with this myself i remember thinking oh she's just beating to her own drum you know nothing's wrong she's just going at her own pace you know Uh, Once you get past that part and you really can kind of say, you know, and I'm starting to like tell myself, trying to convince myself something's not wrong here, just get your child tested. In the States, up until the age of three, you can get them tested through the early intervention program. It's free. You contact your local municipality, local county, and um, you can set that up and they'll come in. When we went through this with my daughter. I didn't even hesitate with my son. I think I had him evaluated three times by early intervention just to make sure. (laughs) Listen, guys, just to make sure, you know what I mean? Even if you're like, you're not even sure, like, oh, I don't want to call them. It's not like that. It's just, you know, it's not that it's just this. And don't even hesitate there. There was nothing wrong, but I had it. I was just the, the statistics say that if you have a child on the spectrum, you're likely to have another child that will have some special needs as yes, well. Yeah. So I didn't even hesitate. So I was like 12 months, 18 months and two years old. He got evaluated at um, through early intervention until I could just feel confident 100 percent that we were not in need of additional support. So I don't hesitate. You're not putting anybody out. This is your job as a parent. And this is out of your realm of expertise. You know what I mean? We're not talking about changing diapers or feeding solids. We're talking about something that we're not, we wouldn't be 100% sure on without professional support anyway. So definitely any hesitations, get them, get them checked out. Um, If you have just been diagnosed, and you're just kind of going through a whirlwind whirlwind of emotions, that's why I've created our, you know, community. I actually have a Facebook group. It's it's free to join. It's called uh, Champions for Our Children. I find one of the first things that you can do after diagnosis is to find community. I think it's important to find other parents that are going through this, but also parents that are looking to support their children in the most healthiest ways possible. And um, so one of the first things I would say is find community. Uh, another thing I would say is to try and try and find somebody, even if it's not me, somebody like me that can kind of help you to get through these emotions as as best as possible so that you can start to take action in a way that'll support development and growth in your in your in your child. Seek out community, seek out professional support, and um, you know, do as much research as you can and follow uh people like us, you and me. I, I, here's a <laughs> Thomas here who's living a great life as an adult with this. And um, learn that there, the spectrum literally is a spectrum. There, you know, one child with autism, you literally know one child with autism. Yeah. Everybody has different ranges and capabilities and just, you know, community, support for yourself and your child and education for you. And then I think those are my top three advices I can give. Well, just, just to um, play, play a little bit of, of devil, devil's advocate, I think one of the... It's not. It's not my opinion. I, I definitely agree with you. I think diagnosis is the way to go. But yes. what would you say to to parents who are worrying about their child having that label? They're worrying that having autism on on their medical records is going to affect them or affect the way that they view themselves. And how how would you sort of go about give, giving them advice? So um, I definitely know how this feels because like I said, I was thinking this was a prison sentence when we were first going through it. So I was just trying to get out of the club. I was like, I'm in this club. I'm just going to do my time. I'm going to stay out of trouble and we're getting out of this club. 
I want to say that um, I used autism, the diagnosis as a tool to help my child, period. That's all it meant to me. So I understand that there's this whole stigma and belief behind that, that, but for me, I never looked at it like anything other than a label that is going to provide my child the best therapies possible to be the happiest she can be. So what I always try and tell parents that kind of struggle with this, if I'm looking at an IEP, because sometimes you'll look at like, you'll look at, um, uh, you know, a psychologist evaluation, or you'll look at an IEP here in the States, that's your, um, the, the individual uh, education plan that they have for yeah, children yeah. with special needs. And sometimes it'll say some things in there that sting, like maybe that, you know, the child flaps or I don't know, is disruptive in class. And these are some of the goals we're going to work on. And, and sometimes that's kind of like a slap in the face, a uh, reality check of that we're in this situation. I don't look at it like it's my kid. I literally look at it like I'm a doctor reading a chart. <laughs> so I say, okay, this is what's going on. These are the goals. I'm not putting any label to this, any whatever. Autism for me equals my ticket to service is plain and simple. And that's what I tell all parents, even ones that are on the fence. Don't look at this as like some type of setback for life and and put, attach all of these like expectations or all these things you think are going to happen because they have this. Just look at this as a, a actually as a, a, a pathway to uh, a solution in the sense of being able to understand and support your child better than you've ever been able to before. So that's how I kind of look at it. I don't yeah. even look at it as like anything life. I just say this is a, a light label to get me what I need to help my daughter uh, be the happiest. I completely agree. And I think a lot of the things that we um, attribute to to labels is is based on how we how you would as as a parent view that label. You know, if you take on board that you know m- maybe they're not going to be sociable then you may sort of pull them out or you may, may stop them doing things that are going to cause them stress or new things that you, you don't think they'll be able to handle. So being able to push them slowly in the, in the right direction in a very caring way is, is yeah. the way forward. But, the, you know, the, the label is, is, is meaningless unless you give meaningless. it meaning. Yeah. That's right. That's a good way to say it. You say it better than I do, Thomas. It's meaningless <laughs> you. unless you give it meaning. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Positive meaning. Yes. Good. Getting the yes, right support. Just, all the stuff. That's but. it. Getting support. <laughs> exactly. Getting, uh, being able to communicate with your child like you've never been able to before. Now you're going to understand their language better. I would say understand it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> she still does stuff that's like bewildering to me, but whatever. <laughs> We're rolling with it. <laughs> cool. So you've, you've, I think you've already given me sort of three main things that you want people to take away. Like, um, did you, did you want to sort of redo those or do you think those are a good things to sort of take away or like three takeaways from our conversation today? All of the conversation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the entire I guess number, <laughs> Yeah. I'm trying to think here. Um, uh, you know, number one is your job is to be a parent and that and it did not change diagnosis or not. I guess that's my first takeaway that your job as a parent has not changed it means more now than it ever did. Two is, you know, a diagnosis is your ticket to services, plain and simple. And that's all it means. It means that the, the more that we've defined the, the, the supports the child needs, the better we can treat it. And if we're, kind of tiptoeing around what really is going on here, then we're really hurting the child at the end of the day, just for our, to save our own ego. And then uh, three is we want to seek out the supports and therapies immediately. Um, it's shown in studies that if we um, expose these children between the, I think it was between the eight, it was Dr. Lova's study in 1987. He did a study of, of I think two to four year olds that were given exposure to an intensive ABA therapy. Now I can't speak to what ABA therapy it was, but it would, but the ABA I'm talking about is what I would expose any child to, which is a loving natural environment, teaching paired relationship with a, a wonderful practitioner of ABA. These children um, came out of that study with either um, indistinguishable or recovered signs of autism. Now I say recovered very lightly and loosely because as we talked, there is no necessarily a recovery from it but 
what I take from that is quality of life has been dramatically improved because the parents took action as quickly as possible. Those are my three uh, that I guess we could take away from this. So we have the last question, and I usually ask this question to autistic people, but I suppose being a parent and and having such a a close connection with, with your child, do you have an idea of what autism means to you? Um, what does it mean to me? You know, I don't know. I really never thought about this. Um, it's a difficult question. Honest, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to our life, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's definitely touched us in a very uh, personal way because my child has autism. Um, what does it mean to me? You know, I, I'm not really even sure how to answer this. I guess, I, I guess it would have meant to us personally is that, you know, I have a child that learns and feels very differently than I do but that doesn't have to define her and define our relationship. For me, it's just, it's, it's like learning and like a learning a new language, but um, there's still, you know, a relationship and rewards to be had between us. So I guess for us, autism is just maybe like a, a slight road bump in our relationship, but not necessarily something that I would want her to feel that she has to define her, her life around. But something that you know you can live a happy life with. Thank you very much for that. There's no, there's no right or wrong, no right or wrong. answers to that. You know, it's just what you feel about it. I think it gives that that question gives people a good sort of idea of of how different people think about autism. Like one of my friends called Adam, who I had on one of my previous podcasts, he's he's always defined himself as himself rather than autistic Adam he's always sort of strived to differentiate himself from it and sort of get good and excel in areas that autistic people shouldn't be able to so he's sort of seen it as like a challenge and something to overcome and then you know on the other side of things you've got people who think think about it as a very integral part of themselves but they you know lo- love that part of themselves it's not a bad thing and they, they sort of learn about it and they you know, work on things and try and craft a life for themselves out of their their experiences and what works for them. I think there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it. And who am I? Who am I to say that any of them are wrong? You know, yeah. everyone's got their own emotions and experiences behind them. It's just about bringing everyone together and uh, having a chat. Yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> I think that I think I'd love her to have that uh, evolution. You know, there's still some things for her to learn, not just as an autistic child, but as a child, period. And um, once we get, you know, past the, you know, I guess even as an adult, you're learning too. But as my responsibilities uh, come to a close, yeah, I'd want her to kind of take the reins and figure out what how what this means to her. And whatever that is, I'm going to support. That's a great ending message. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) So, Michelle. Where can people find your work? Where can people find you on the the big world of the internet? Sure. So uh, my website is michellebrogers.com. I am on Facebook uh, as Michelle Rogers. I am also have a group on there. I'd love everybody to join if they wanted. It was It's called Champions for Our Children. And um, I am on Instagram as uh, Michelle Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> Brogers. Yes, oh, Rogers. So sorry, I didn't even say yeah, it right. Brogers, yeah. You got Michelle your own name. Rogers. Right. Yes, there you go. There you go. And then, so, yeah, you could con- contact me through there. And uh, like I said, we are uh, launching a self study course at the end of, the, of October. It's called Advocating Like a Boss. <laughs> if you couldn't tell, I'm a little bit of an ins- assertive personality. So, uh, a well fitting title for our self study car- course. It's like all of the the intricacies of, of, of just getting a, a basic understanding of what you need to do to hit the ground running for your kids. And then I do offer one-on-one coaching if somebody wanted support specifically with what they're working through. And then come the new year, I think we're going to be uh, launching the Champions for Our Children Masterclass, which is going to be so exciting and awesome for me. We're going to do group coaching. We're all going to be in this together and we'll work on all our individual goals uh, in a community format, which I think will be fabulous. So. Brilliant. Thank you very much for those. So if you enjoyed this episode and you want to 
listen to some more, you want to listen to some more episodes, you can find the 40 OT podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Very easy to find. All you got to do is search it. Free, available to everybody. And if you want to stay up to date with my day to day, you can always follow me on my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under Asperger's Growth. Again, very easy to find. Um, what's the last thing? YouTube channel, of course. It's a little bit lagging behind in terms of videos coming out. Um, I, as I said, I am back at work now, so the the amount of time that I have in the day is very limited, and uh, I want to try and get these podcasts out as much as I can. And if you do have a story, I am currently in the process of recording new podcasts for editing and putting out. So if you want to get in contact with me on my social medias or aspergisgrowth at gmail.com, you are very welcome to. Thank you very much, Michelle, for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It. Thank I've you for having I've had a good me. time chatting about this. Yes, me too. I was a tiny, I was a little bit nervous about sort of talking around sort of um, the parenting styles and stuff, but I feel like we, we've, we've got a good, you know, we, we had a good uh, conversation about it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I, I like talking to you too. I'm excited to uh, continue our conversations. Yeah. Over on your, um, what's it? <laughs> I was going to do it on YouTube. So we'll have to see if you're, if you're game for that. I was going to just do it on YouTube. So like a live stream. We could either do a live stream or we could do, um, we could do it and just kind of like do it on zoom and upload it, whatever, whatever tickles your fancy. Cool. But yeah, go, go, go over and check Michelle's stuff out and, um, yeah, let us know what you think of this episode. And I hope you have a good day. Whether it's the night yes. time, have a good sleep. Whether it's <laughs> the afternoon, have a good day. And whether it's the morning, get your coffee in. Make sure that you're up and ready to take life on. I was going to say grab it by the balls, but that's a little <laughs> bit unprofessional. That's okay. Take it on like I a like boss. That. <laughs> there you go. Advocate like a boss. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, folks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>